And now I'm going to hand things over to Justin Boone. Justin is the coordinator of the Building Science TRG. Justin. Thank you, Laurel. Um, Norbert, <clears throat> sorry, I'm happy to introduce uh, Norbert Krogstad. Uh, since joining WJE in 1983, um, Norbert has specialized in the investigation of moisture and condensation problems. In addition to performing hundreds of such investigations, he was also a member of the ASHRAE committee that developed the ASHRAE 160 standard, Criteria for Moisture Control Design Analysis in Buildings. Uh, without further ado, uh, Norbert, thanks a lot. Good afternoon. Um, the presentation I'm going to talk about today is the role of air pressure in condensation problems. The learning objectives, as you can see, I'm going to go over some basic physics of condensation as it relates to buildings, in particular um, building cladding systems. I'm going to go over how some common ways that pressure differentials develop in buildings, how condensation problems are caused by these pressure differentials, and then to learn to identify condensation-related problems and discuss some repair approaches in case studies. The outline of the presentation is as follows. I'm going to start out with the basics, like I said, the, sort of the physics of condensation, and then the specific role of air pressure and air flow on these condensation problems. Then I'm going to go through four case studies where I'm going to look at a little different aspect of what we talked about related to pressure and airflow related condensation problems, duct leakage, um, negative pressure with reservoir cladding, positive pressure and stack effect, and then it just a case where the mechanical system pressurization was basically backwards. It was inappropriate for the space. Condensation basics. Now the some of the basic physics, I realize this is going to be review for a lot of people, but I just want to make sure we're all starting on the same page. Um, warm air holds more moisture than cold air. That's a key point in understanding condensation problems. When air is cooled below the capacity of, that it can hold, the, obviously it can't hold any water, so the water must leave. And that's really what condensation is about. The moisture deposition that occurs due to the fact that the air can no longer hold on to the moisture. Um, it's related to the dew point temperature. That's the that's just a measure of the moisture content in the air. And it simply means this is the temperature when this air becomes saturated and can no longer hold any more moisture. Why it's important, as we'll talk about a lot later, is that any surface below the dew point temperature of the air will accumulate moisture simply because the air next to it can't hold the moisture anymore because the air gets cooled to that temperature. Moisture is deposited on these surfaces and it, if the surface is below freezing, it'll be frost. And if it's above freezing, it's water. We'll talk about that also. This is sort of a diagram showing moisture capacity. Um, think of each one, there's the, the one on the left is 70 degree air, 50 degree air in the center, and 30 degree air in on the right. Now the capacity of 70 degree air to hold moisture is 8.5 grains per cubic foot. So that's the amount of mass of water that that air can hold. It won't hold any more than that. If we put in 4.1 grains of moisture, then the relative humidity is the ratio of the amount it can hold versus the amount that's in the air. So in this case, for 70 degree air, it's 4.1 divided by 8.5, which is 48%. Now we talk, we'll talk a lot about dew point. The dew point is 50 degrees in this case. And by looking at the middle diagram, it's pretty easy to understand why it's 50 degrees. It's because at 50 degrees, air can only hold 4.1 grains. So in that case, it's saturated. It's got 100% relative humidity. It's, now the first one, at 70 degrees, it's 48% relative humidity. At 50 degrees, it's 100%. And that's sort of pointing to the fact that you really don't want to look at relative humidity because 100% sounds like a lot of humidity, but it's still the same amount of moisture. 
It's 4.1 grains per cubic foot. And it's a dew point of 50 degrees because that's the temperature at which anything below 50 degrees will get condensation. Now we go to the third one. If we cool that air down to 30 degrees Fahrenheit, 30 degrees Fahrenheit will only hold 1.9 grains per cubic foot. So what happens is that excess mortar water has to leave. It has to go somewhere because it can't be in the air anymore. It's It'll become saturated air because it'll be still 1.9 will be left in the air per cubic foot, and the capacity of the air is 1.9, so it's 100% relative humidity, but it's less moisture. We took moisture out of the air, so the dew point changes. The only way that dew point can ever change is either you add moisture to the air or take moisture out of the air. Dew point is not changed by the temperature like relative humidity, which is why we really want to look at dew point and not relative humidity when we're looking at moisture problems, condensation moisture problems. Now, as this air, when air comes in contact with a cold surface, the air adjacent to that surface cools down because the surface is causing the air to cool down. When it does, if that is if that surface is below the dew point temperature of the air, the air adjacent to it will deposit its moisture on that cold surface because it can no longer hold the air because it's below its dew point temperature. So that's that's in essence what happens in condensation when you have a, a, a glass of Coke or a glass of water and it forms on there, it's because the air next to it has been lowered before, below its dew point temperature due to the cold surface. So condensation moisture problems, condensation develops when one of the two things happens. Either the surface temperature in the space is lowered or moisture is added to the air adjacent to the surface. So condensation, something has to change. If there wasn't condensation and now there is condensation, we either lower the temperature or we added moisture to the air. Sort of a, 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 going over a little bit more the dew point as a key indicator, if we look at outside air, 100% relative humidity, but it's only 13 degrees, we would call that dry air, simply because it doesn't have, it can't hold very much moisture. In this case, only 0.85 grains per cubic foot. Now, if we raise the temperature of that air to 70 degrees, it's only 10% relative humidity, which is why we call that dry air. Why we say cold air is dry air, because it just can't hold very much moisture. 10% is a low relative humidity for indoors. When you're in 10% air, you're gonna start having, seeing some health issues, more static electricity, more dryness, because there isn't much moisture in the air. But all we did was increase the temperature, and we did not add any moisture. We did not take any moisture away, so the dew point stays the same. It's still 13 degrees. Some of the other ones are just sort of key benchmarks to look at. For 70 degrees, 24% relative humidity is 32 degrees. That's a key benchmark because if we see condensation in the form of frost, all we know is that the surface is very cold because 24 isn't really that high of a relative humidity. So if we have only frost, only condensation in the form of frost, we probably have a problem with our cladding and not necessarily any issue with the amount of moisture in the air. So we don't have excessive humidity. Another one we look at is 30% just because a lot of hospitals have that as their minimum. So surfaces would have to be above 38 degrees to not have condensation. And again, 40%, a lot of hospitals, they have a range between 30 and 40 percent, so 45 degrees would be the upper end that if there's 40 percent relative humidity where condensation would form on surfaces below that. And I put in 70 degrees, which is 50 percent, for a couple of reasons. One, it's, a, it's easy to remember because it's basically 
50 degrees, almost 50 degrees Fahrenheit is the dew point and 50%. So it's the same number, easy to remember. But another thing is that a lot of art museums and museums go for 50% because it's good 10% relative humidity to maintain the artwork at. When we're looking at moisture problems in a building, the one thing I always caution people is always start out with the most obvious and make sure you rule out the most obvious before you get down to other issues. In most moisture problems in buildings, water leakage is often the case. It could be a leaky pipe, it could be a leakage from a roof, it could be a leakage from a wall. It could also be construction moisture, especially if the building was just built. A lot of times they may build a roof and it rained and they trapped water when they put the insulation and the membrane on top, they trapped water in the roof. There's a lot of things. So construction moisture is still probably of projects I look at the number one cause. But the second cause is air pressure and air movement. If we have ruled out water leakage and construction moisture, and it's a condensation related problem, most likely that is the case, that it's related to this air pressure differential and associated air movement. Now we also have potential for problems with vapor diffusion, but I've really only seen those in my, in my experience on cold storage facilities and, and things where it's, it's pretty severe. The, in general, we talk about vapor barrier, and one of the things I want to sort of go through in this presentation, either vapor barrier or vapor retarder, in most cases, it's the critical element is not whether it's a vapor barrier or vapor retarder, it's whether or not it's acting as an air barrier or air retarder. So just some basic understanding of air pressure and air flow. Air moves from high pressure to low pressure and not the, obviously not the other way around. Air the interior air pressure, when the interior air pressure is higher than the exterior air pressure, we call that positively pressurized. And that can happen when the mechanical system brings in more outside air, or more exterior air, than is removed. So we're adding more air than we're removing, so the building is building up pressure. It can also happen on, on buildings, I've seen a lot of warehouses where they have loading doors on one side, if those loading doors are on the windward side, it can pressurize the building. So it can have a lot to do with the direction of the openings where air infiltration or leakage is occurring. We also have in tall buildings, commonly during cold, cold weather, we'll have a positive pressure on the upper floors due to stack effect. And then during warm weather, we'll have the higher pressure at the lower floors. So that's when we end up with positive pressure. Now, I'm not gonna go through them all, but with negative pressure, it's just the opposite of all those things. So just sort of to demonstrate positive pressurization, we have more air coming in than we're exhausting. We're building up pressure against all the walls, so that would be positive pressure. Negative pressure is gonna occur when we take out more air than we're letting in. So more air is being exhausted than is being introduced. So all the walls will be pulled in, so to speak, and that would be negative pressure. Now, typically we think of, there's a lot of units in buildings that really just recirculate air. We have, um, this could be a, you know, some fans over kitchens, just simply take air and filter it and move it back out into the space. And there's a lot of unit ventilators in buildings that just move air around. That doesn't, this, that would not create a pressure difference as long as the air put into the, the room is the same as the air that's leaving the room. However, we have a lot of cases where air is supplied on one side but there isn't enough vent space or flow for it to go in. And so 
more air is being pulled out of one side and then it's being put in. Now we're not, we haven't changed anything with the outside. The relationship to the outside is just the same. So if we were neutral before, the whole building is still neutral. However, one room is now positive because we're pushing more air into that room than we're taking out. And the other room is negative because we're taking more air out than we're putting in. So even though we haven't affected whole building pressurization, it's, they balance each other out. We have localized effects where we have positive air pressure on one side and negative air pressure on the other side. And that's gonna, a demonstration of this is a real common problem that used to happen, and it still does happen in some of the low-end hotels, where they bring in outside air into the corridor, which is then supposed to go in the room, and they have continuous bathroom exhaust in the room. So we end up with positive pressure in the corridor. However, a lot of these older systems anyway use door undercuts to bring those in, but those door undercuts were pretty small and really did not let the air go in very quickly. There's also transfer grills that are um, with smoke and fire dampers that are sometimes used for this. So what happens with the continuously operating bathroom exhaust, even though the building was designed to be balanced, or even if they decide actually designed the building with more air going into the corridor than was leaving the exhaust, the rooms would still be negative. And that's that whole thing we talked about just a few minutes ago, where even though the whole building may be positive relative to the exterior or neutral relative to the exterior, the rooms in this case are negative. And since the rooms are where the exterior wall is located, there is then a pressure difference across the exterior wall, which can cause air infiltration. And so we've seen a lot of problems in the hotel and motel industry with air being pulled through the walls and condensing within the walls. As we'll talk about later, this is especially a problem when you have what we'll call reservoir cladding, masonry materials that store water because the in those cases, the dew point temperature in the wall can actually be much greater than it is outside. Now, another situation happens from duct leakage. Same example, we have that exhaust fan, but we have it's, it's leaking duct, leaking air through the ductwork. And as a result, the entire wall can act as a duct because it, the air is being made up, not from the room, the duct is located in the wall, so the leakage in the joints in the duct are pulling air from the wall. This can actually cause air to be pulled from the outside, or in the case of reservoir cladding, from the brick cavity space and into the wall. This is an example of that where we see there's, this was had vinyl wall covering. When you pull the vinyl wall covering at, back, you can see that the upper soffit was acting as an unintended duct because the bathroom exhaust leaking through the joints was pulling air from the wall to the bathroom through that soffit. We also have stack effect. Now in warm weather, stack effect causes the upper floors to be positive and the lower floors to be negative when you have a staff that connects the building. And one thing I want to point out is most buildings do have some means of air moving up and down, so it's fairly common to have stack effect. So in the case, as you see here, in warm weather, you have positive on the upper floor and negative on the bottom floors. The opposite is true in hot weather. Now stack effect, this is the equation for stack effect, but it's actually very simple. It really looks at the density of the outside air and the density of the inside air. And then there's a, a conversion factor showing where the neutral plane exists. And so I'll just sort of show this. If we have warm air, which is defined by the red line, and cold air defined by the blue line, warm air is less dense than cold air. So if you have a column 
of a vertical column of warm air, the pressure at the bottom of that column will be less than a similar pressure of cold air. So that would be the equivalent of the pressure from that column of warm air. And that would be the bracket, the blue bracket there shows the increased pressure due to the denser cold air. So the pressure at the bottom is going to be greater just because effectively the column of air is heavier for the cold air than it is for the warm air. Now in a building between the interior and the exterior, if we have, this is in cold weather, the exterior will be cold, the interior will be warm. So there's a, a neutral pressure level. That's the point in the building where the pressure on the inside of the building is equal to the pressure on the outside of the building. However, since the cold air is has a greater density than the interior warm air, the air will always move from the higher pressure to the lower pressure. So at the bottom of the building, you can see by the simple, simple diagram that the air is going to move into the building at the lower floors because it's moving from the outside, which is the blue line, which is colder and denser, to the red line, which is interior air. At the top of the building, just because of the differences in density, the air will move from the interior to the exterior. So that is why under, in cold weather, the upper floors are going to be higher pressure and the lower floors lower pressure. Obviously, the opposite occurs when the interior is air conditioned and the outside is heated. In that case, at the lower floors, again, it moves from high pressure to low pressure, so at lower floors, since the interior is the colder air, it's going to move from the interior to the exterior. And at the upper floors, it's going to move from the exterior to the interior. So moving from the exterior to the interior is negatively pressurized, and moving from the interior to the exterior at the bottom is positively pressurized. So the building is positively pressurized at the lower floors and negatively pressurized at the upper floors during hot weather. Now the neutral plane doesn't have to be in the center of the building. In fact, it doesn't have to be in the building at all. And we'll show that in, in later in the example. But in this case, I have the neutral plane down at the lower floors of the building. So in this case, when it, if, the, if this is a warm weather example, then the blue line would be the interior and the red line would be the exterior. So we have a pretty large negative at the upper floors of the building and only a slight positive at the bottom just because the neutral plane is closer to the bottom. We can also have a, the neutral plane near the top of the building and the opposite would be true where the pressure difference at the bottom of the building is much greater. Now, we, we love to make buildings with dividing up each floor or at least dividing up the building in half to try to reduce these, this effect. Because if we can divide the building into two zones that there is no way for air to go between them, then we can make the pressure differences half. So we can have much less positive, much less negative. So in this case, we show the air barrier level at the middle of this building. And the one thing we have to be careful of, though, now we have a pretty big pressure differential that's occurring at the middle of that building. So if there's any holes or voids, the air can flow pretty well, and, and, and then it would destroy the barrier. So it really has to be a pretty good barrier, because as a, if we to achieve that barrier, we're going to end up with a fairly significant pressure difference across those floors. The role of air pressure and airflow is twofold. One, if the air is flowing through or against a cladding, if cold air is flowing through or against the cladding, it will cool the cladding system along the airflow path or wherever it's contacting the surfaces. So if cold air 
is either flowing against or through a wall system, that coal there is going to cool everything that it touches. The other issue that happens, so remember the talking earlier, I said there's two things that have to change for condensation problems to occur. Either we have to lower the temperature or we have to increase the moisture. In this case, we can also have air pressure and airflow increase the moisture. That happens when air is moving from high moisture areas to low moisture areas. And since in most, almost all cases, because warm air holds so much more moisture than cold air, it almost always causes an increase of moisture when it's going from warm air to cold air. I once had a project where the, the owner was saying that there's so much moisture in the wall, he was, a, you know, if this is during very cold weather, he was assuming there must be, it must have been water that was stored in the masonry that was causing the water to condense in the masonry. But that's not what's happening because the water, the air isn't going to, the outside air is going to be very dry and the cavity air, any water in the masonry is going to stay in the masonry. If there's a film of ice forming on the masonry, it's got to be because warm air is moving from the inside to the outside. So it's just something to keep in mind. There's, there are cases, but they're very rare, where you would ever have a case where the source of moisture is the cooler air. Almost always, it's going to be the warmer air. So now, with looking at just the first aspect that, of the change when the surface temperature is lowered by building pressurization, if we're talking cold exterior temperature, cold weather examples, it is it, the moisture problem happens when air, it, it can cool the surface when air infiltration occurs. You get this a lot of times around windows and other elements where it's really cold outside and it's negatively pressurized, the window gets cooled along the airflow path. So there may be surfaces that get cool and you'll see condensation forming in different points where there's an air infiltration path. During warm air, warm weather, the opposite happens. The air will move out of the wall. So in this case, if we have cold exterior air moving through the wall, it could cause condensation on the outside along the airflow path. This is a diagram to illustrate that. So on the left side, we have the example of cold weather, where it's negatively pressurized in this case. So the cold air is moving through the wall system and it's cooling the surfaces along that airflow path. So if we had 70 degree Fahrenheit and 30% relative humidity, which is usually the minimum which most hospitals run, if that airflow, that zero degree air, cools the surface to 37 degrees or colder, we will have condensation along those airflow paths. Now in hot weather, I show an example where we have 70 degree air moving through. And again, if that 70 degree air can cool the surface below 77 degrees, which is the dew point of that exterior air at 90 degrees Fahrenheit and 65% relative humidity, then the condensation will form. So again, looking at the dew point, it's key here because it really gives us an idea of where the condensation is going to form. If the air is a dew point of 37 degrees, like on the left, the water will form, will condense on any surface that's below 37 degrees. And on the right, if it's below 77 degrees, we'll have condensation on those portions of the cladding. This is an example where the surface temperature is reduced not just because of air flowing through, but air flowing against. If you look, you see the registers. These registers 
are putting are putting cold air against the in this case the glass doors because it's an easy demonstration and you can see the pattern of the condensation the whole door isn't condensing it's just condensing where that air from the air conditioner is flowing against the glass and that's because the air from the air conditioner is much colder from those registers than the air in the air within the room so the air flowing out of those registers locally cools the wall and we can get condensation problems like this in cladding systems as well where wall where air flows against drywall it can locally cool the air the surface temperature of that drywall below the dew point in some cases causing condensation to occur inside the wall now the other part of this has to do with increasing the moisture of the air which is the second thing we can either reduce the temperatures or we can increase the moisture well building pressurization can do this as well now the interesting thing to note here is it's the opposite in this case cold weather issues air during cold weather the air exfiltration of the air moving from the interior to the exterior is causing the problem because it's moving warm air which again typically has significantly more moisture than the outside air it's moving then more warm air through the wall system increasing the moisture content of the air within the wall now in warm weather issues we have the same thing it's the opposite of what was causing the surface to cool so we reduce the temperature by bringing inside air out by positive pressurization but we increase the moisture of the air within the wall by drawing it from the outside in because we're drawing it from warm air to cold air and warm air holds more moisture now this is especially a problem when we talk about reservoir claddings now again I'll talk about that in a second here but the we if we here's another diagram that sort of shows this if we have positive air pressure during cold weather it shows minus 10 out 70 degrees inside that air will condense along the airflow path so you'd get condensation on the first plane that it, it occur that it encounters that's below the dew point temperature of the air so in this case it's the precast concrete in the, on the left and on the right it's the curtain wall during negative pressure air will move through the wall system or through the window system in a spandrel system and then condense on the first surface that it meets that's below the dew point now there has to typically be an air there has to be ability for air to be in direct contact with the surface so if the insulation is bonded to the the sheathing in this case of the gypsum wallboard such as spray foam insulation there's no surface onto which the the air will condense because there is no air space so having an air space is an important aspect of this problem now this is again reservoir cladding materials like concrete masonry or masonry can absorb water during rain and then store that water now this is a this I'll explain a little bit more about this but this is actually you see the droplets of water on the shelf angle the shelf angle is colder because it's connected to the floor slab which is cooled by the interior there's insulation it's an insulated cavity so the the masonry is warmer and the outside's warmer this was an opening that was made and when the opening was made it actually fogged up my glasses when I was doing it because um, the humidity in the air in that space was much greater than the humidity outside so if you think about it we have masonry wall it rains the masonry wall takes on moisture now the Sun comes down out and bakes on that masonry wall 
the surface temperature of the masonry, we've actually measured up in excess of 160 degrees on a medium brown colored brick on the outside surface. The inside surface would be not that hot, but it's still elevated significantly. We've had air in the cavity in excess of 100 degrees when, it, in, when a wall is exposed to burning sun all day. Now, if that wall had water in it, that water in the wall is going to evaporate. It's going to evaporate to the exterior, but it's also going to evaporate into that cavity. And if that cavity air is 100 degrees and there's enough water to keep evaporating, the dew point temperature of that cavity air will reach 100 degrees. 100 degree dew point is a very rare occurrence in most climates. It's tropical. It's very unusual, but it can happen frequently in reservoir claddings. So we can actually have air that we're pulling in that's much more humid than the outside is, just simply because the water from the masonry evaporated into the air in the space, causing an increase in the moisture content of that air, making it saturated. I'm going to go through some case studies here. Um, now, this first one is a housing for the elderly. And this one we're going to talk about, it's going to be the answer here, the secret is going to be, it's going to be duct leakage that's occurring. The system consisted of exterior precast concrete panels. We look back at this previous one, it looks like brick, but it's not. What it is is they actually took the precast, it's stamped and then stained to look like brick in mortar. So it's really a precast concrete panels. This isn't a brick clad precast, it's actually a brick pattern. So there's the inside of these was insulated with foil face foam insulation. And there was Z furring attached to the precast between the uh, at regular spacings, which was used to attach the gypsum wall board, and the insulation was fitted between these Z furrings. There was also vinyl doors and vinyl windows. Now, one thing about this is precast concrete, which was is sealed with the seal and joints with the vinyl windows and doors, which have welded corners, and were pretty, they were actually pretty tight, at least initially. We have a pretty good air barrier created by the precast concrete and the exterior wall system. So we don't have a lot of airflow through this wall. It's pretty tight. The way the system, mechanical system worked is it had rooftop units that would supply the hallways and the public spaces. So we have air being, outside air being brought into the building in the hallways and the public spaces. But the one thing about it is we don't have much of any air, we don't have any intentional air going into the rooms. This was a case where they used door undercuts, but there wasn't very much air able to go through the door on their cuts. They were very small. The bathrooms also had switch-operated exhausts. So this, the exhaust would only work when the bathroom light and fan was on. In this case, the light. They were synced together. So as a result, the only way we can dissipate moisture is to actually open the windows. Now, if you, they did have a forced air unit in the furnace in each unit in air conditioning, but all it did was recirculate air. It brought the air in the bottom and it pumped it through ductwork that went into all the rooms. So there was a return air grills and there was exhaust grills, but it just circulated the air. So getting back to the way we have to dissipate moisture. So these, this is housing for the elderly. It's cold weather out bitterly cold, minus 10 degrees, minus 5 degrees, 0 degrees. 
the they're cooking pasta, they're taking showers, they're washing the floors, they're generating a lot of moisture in the air. But we can't dissipate that moisture. So the moisture builds up in the rooms. And the only way this this was designed based on a light and ventilation schedule, which is still permitted by the code, which basically says says that your window should be, in this case, um, I think it was maybe 8% of the floor area had to be for light. So they had to have 8% of the floor area in glass and 4% of the floor area in ventilation. So the, they had double hung windows and they had to be open. If you think about it, you have a very sealed building with the precast concrete and the windows that were all sealed in place. It's a barrier. And now we're asked, now we're, when we have corridor makeup air, but there's no real convenient way for that air to get into the units. So the only way that they were actually able to get ventilation is to open the windows. Now, if you've been around many housing for the elderly, I've done several inspections. You're going to go into these different rooms and you, you probably be best to go with a short sleeve shirt. Because in a lot of cases, these buildings, they keep the building very high, hot, because they have a lot of people, when they get older, we're all going to get there. Um, the blood circulation isn't as good, and they're, they're cold all the time. Now you're going to ask people for housing for the elderly to open their windows to get the moisture. So we end up with a lot of moisture in the spot. But it still gets a little more confusing because... The only the the way it was designed with the bathroom fans, the, the rooms were either neutral or negative typically. Yet we had water condensing within the walls and dripping down from the windows. This didn't occur during rains. It only occurred when we had warming periods, following periods of cold weather. Water was condensing on the precast. Well the building's negative. So what I said before is that should be good. We have the cold, dry air moving through the wall, drying out the wall, and not the other way around. Remember I said we had problems when warm, moist air moves out of the building in, in cold climates because it brings that warm air, which has more moisture, and, and moves it against the cold surfaces in the airflow path. But in this case, the opposite seemed to be happening. We had a situation where we had very high moisture because we didn't have a lot of air changes because the only way the system would work based on light and ventilation system schedule would be for the, for the occupants to open the windows. So with cooking, cleaning, showers, and all the activities, the humidity built up in the rooms. The second and they didn't want to open the windows because it's cold outside, and who wants to open the windows during cold weather? The second issue was that we were having, uh, as I was going through, um, okay, as we going through the, the system, we had condensation forming on the back of the precast that when the sun came out, it melted, it formed frost on the back of the precast, and it dripped into the windows. We also had at the top of the wall, an area where there was a lot more moisture and airflow. There's like a little gap in the insulation at the top of the wall, and that gap was filling with basically had a lot of moisture in it. So we had a situation where this building was negative because the bathroom fans, which are switch operated, only worked when the bathroom fan was on, but it's still there was no exterior makeup air, so that was the only exhaust. And a lot of people ran the fans a lot longer to try to dissipate the moisture in the rooms. So the fans are running quite a bit. So a lot of cases, these rooms are negative. However, it looked as if the air was moving from the outs inside to the outside, which didn't make sense with the buildings being negative. We checked that with pressure, and it was they certainly were negative. So we made some additional openings. We took the drywall off, and at the demising wall, at, the, at one of the walls where we had the unit, 
we had an area where they had used bat insulation. You can see the end of the ductwork just to the left of the circle and the bat insulation with the yellow circle there. And we had a almost like a, a at the demising wall, almost a vertical channel that was formed. We had a similar horizontal channel at the top of the wall. So we suspected that these were there, there was an issue with air flowing. We also, along that vertical channel, we had a lot of signs of condensation. There was mold on the gypsum wallboard when we removed it, and there was corrosion on the, the studs. So we could tell that moisture was moving in these particular paths. And it was actually a pretty big gap that we had, um, more so than just we would have drywall on either side of that wall, but it was more so than that. We actually had pretty big gaps. So what we did in this case is we set up a bunch of instrumentation. Um, this was connected to a data acquisition system and, and the Internet. Um, and so we could actually access the information in our office. We had put temperature gauges on the different windows. Um, within the wall in various locations, we had surface temperature of the precast, and then we measured the temperature and humidity of the air within that space. And we had some high up on the wall and some low. We also measured the exterior temperature. And so this was some of the plots that we had. Um, this was from, I say, the living room outlet. This is down low in the room, uh, room unit 352. We actually had several units instrumented. And you can see that, in this case, the red line, which is the temperature of the precast, was varying between around um, 65 and during this time period down to maybe 15 degrees. So it was varying with the exterior temperature. And we also had the dew point temperature, which is following that fairly closely, which is a little unusual. Um, when we got to the top of the wall, we found that during many periods of time, the, the red line for the temperature of the precast concrete at the top of the wall was virtually identical to what it was down below. Um, again, varying, going down, it was a little warmer. It was going from a temperature um, high of around 65. And let's see, before, the, it went down to 15. But in this case, it only went down to maybe 20, 22, 24. So we had slightly warmer warmer precast temperatures, which is a little unusual, but when we can see that the dew point temperature of the air, we had water, we had condensation. So now we have condensation at the upper portion of the wall, but not at the lower portion. And what we found when we opened it up was that area of the duct, both vertically and horizontally, where we saw the moisture, what was happening was the air in the duct is pressurized. But that air was leaking out of the duct. So it's kind of the opposite of that case we had previously talked about with the continuously operating bathroom exhaust that had leakage that made the wall negatively pressurized. In this case, the duct made the wall positively pressurized. But because that duct was connected and there was like a vertical channel at the, at the wall and a horizontal channel at the top of the wall, we ended up with air from the duct leaking into the soffit and then blowing in against the precast. So even though the building was negatively pressurized and even though the air was moving, should have been moving from the outside in, we had the problem. So how we solved this actually was just, we actually just separated the inside wall from the outside wall by actually putting drywall across and actually isolated it so that the drywall, in this case, acted as the air barrier. To correct the moisture problem, we actually switched the bathroom fans so they ran continuously. We put very quiet fans in so the people didn't notice it. And when they turned the fan on, it, it, it tripled the airflow, but it was a much larger fan. And we also brought outside makeup air into the room. The next example is an example with a hospital 
that had negative pressure and a reservoir cladding. Now that's unusual for the hospital to be negatively pressurized. It wasn't by design, it was actually not working properly, not balancing properly. But what we had in the wall construction, we had four inch brick veneer, we had two inch cavity that had an inch and a, I think it was with an inch and a half of polystyrene insulation. I think there was a half inch space. It may have been one inch. We had the four inch concrete masonry, two inch studs, with then foil faced insulation, so we had additional insulation, gypsum wallboard, and vinyl wall covering. So we had, I believe it was one inch of polystyrene in the wall and two inches in the foil face bat insulation in the stud space. And we had mold, the telltale pink and mostly pink stains with some yellow stains too, of the, where the acids of the mold attack some of the pigments in the wall covering. When we pulled the wall covering back, there was the black mold and pulled the drywall off. There's a variety of different colors of mold. And this was the case I actually got this example on. That was the shelf angle. It was very cold. It was cold, but the moisture content of the air into that in that masonry wall. It's a light colored brick, but it still was very high. And we had condensation forming on the gypsum, which also caused corrosion of the studs. So the cause of the mold growth in this case was water penetrated and saturated the masonry during rain. That stored the water, making it a reservoir cladding. Air infiltration due to the negative pressure carried the moist air into the wall system. Now we had a really good correlation because this is a hospital that had a variety of different rooms. We had some areas that had massive damage, and those were the infection control rooms that were required to be under a significant negative pressure to stop infection from being spread through the rest of the hospital. The typical rooms were slightly neg were somewhat negative, and then we had on the exterior wall we had some ICU areas where were significantly positive pressure. We didn't have any damage in those, even though they had the same vinyl wall covering and everything else. The issue with the vinyl wall covering is that it does not allow the water to evaporate to the interior. So as a result, the moisture stays in the wall. It, it, the air infiltration brought that moist air in, it condensed, and it can't evaporate. It's not gonna go to the outside because the airflow keeps bringing in more and more moisture and it can't dry out to the inside because the vinyl's there. The mold then grows on the paper face of the gypsum wallboard and on the paste for the wall covering. Now even though a lot of the paste can say, contain mildicide, it doesn't work very long under severe conditions and mold and mildew will grow. So the simple solution to this was actually to increase the pressurization in areas that were negatively pressurized. Obviously, we could not do that for the infection control, but we also reduced the gypsum wall board and eliminated the vinyl wall covering, and we we put the made the paint walls painted instead, and that was that worked even in the infection control where there was a more severe condition. Nowadays, um, we would go with paperless gypsum wall board in these cases. The next one I'm going to talk about is a hospital where we're going to talk a little bit about positive pressure during cold weather and stack effect. Similar to the other housing for the elderly that I looked at, we had an issue where there was moisture that was accumulating inside the walls in the form of ice that then once it melted, it would drip into the inside. And we had water flowing down the inside. There was there were many reports, there were so many stains that people were convinced that it was occurring during rain. So they were monitoring it all summer long, not a drop anywhere. But the first really warm day after a cold snap, it just flowed in everywhere. It was clearly a condensation related issue. So the condensation formed on the 
on the cold surfaces that were all located on the exterior face of the insulation. This included the curtain wall spandrels and the precast panels. So the moisture then was due to the air flowing from the interior to the exterior, which again is what we would have expected in the housing for the elderly where it was the opposite case. But in this case, it was the positively pressurized hospital, which they did for infection control, allowed the air to flow, but it was able to flow through the wall system. We also had significantly worse problems at the upper floors due to stack effect. The airflow path was, and we'll show you in a second, the foil scrim craft membrane, the FSK. There was an airspace, and the significance of the airspace is, remember was, it, earlier diagram showed that we, you need an airspace for the condensation to, to occur. If their insulation, such as spray foam or something else, is intimately bonded to a surface, it's not going to form, condense on that surface. If anything, if it's cold enough, it would have to condense on the interior face of the insulation, which in most cases couldn't happen. And then there was gutters. And the significance about gutters is they had to be drained. And the fact that they were drained meant that there was lots of holes. So the system didn't work as an air barrier. So we were requiring the FSK membrane to work as an air barrier with its many joints, which we'll talk about. So the frost formed during periods of cold weather and then it melt, melted during a warming period, causing leakage. So this is this was actually during a warming period. You can see the droplets of water on the spandrel and then drops the water on the precast concrete as well. Now, an interesting thing to point out is that we usually think of, we have precast concrete, we have thermofiber, we have nothing organic. We're not gonna get any mold because there's no food. But that's not the case. And the reason that's not the case is because along the airflow path, is carried dust. Dust contains a high amount of cellulose fiber. Most dust, that's the number one ingredient of most household dust or dust that we see in most buildings. A lot of cellulose fibers. Those cellulose fibers get deposited on the moist surfaces. So the mold isn't growing on the precast. It's actually growing on the cellulose fibers that were deposited along the airflow paths on the precast. So we actually had mold growth on both the precast and on the gaskets and sometimes on the glass. So for the spandrel glass, we had condensation formed, and when that condensation melted in the warm weather, it filled up the channel. Now, there, this wasn't intended to be a drainage channel in this area. So in this area, it flowed down the jams, or in a lot of cases, it actually soaked into the interior and wet the gypsum wallboard soffits here and caused mold there as well. Now with the precast concrete, we also had condensation occurring. And actually, you could see the gutters were actually up fairly high here. So the condensation formed and melted and then it ran into the inside. And in some cases, then this actually also formed the same thing when it melted, it soaked in onto the gypsum wallboard on the ceiling. Now we had a significant stack effect in this building. This building was a fairly tall, is a fairly tall hospital. Um, as you can see, it's, the upper floors are almost 300 feet above the ground. We measured it, the pressure, building pressure at, at several levels, at about the 75 foot level, at about the 190 foot level, and the 270 or 280 foot level. And we measured it during when it was minus 12 degrees out. And it very, it, the pink line or the, is the actual, what we would calculate the pressure by stack effect. So the building fairly closely 
followed the stack effect pressure. And the neutral, you can see the neutral pressure zone in that case was about 43 feet above ground. Now they were intending the building to be positive pressure. And the, they were actually shooting for about between 0 0.01 and, I mean, excuse me, not 0 0.01, 0 0.1 and 0.2 inches of water. So at the first floor, but because of the, the airflow that they had, they were unable to achieve it on these cold days. But we also measured it at a day when it was 41 degrees out, sort of a moderate day. In this case, we did have the 0.1 inches of water at the first floor. They did achieve it. And once again, we fairly closely tracked the calculated pressure. In this case, since the entire building was positively pressurized, there is no neutral plane. It's, it's, in this case, they showed the theoretical line. And obviously, I could have drawn that a few different ways. But in this case, it was 104 feet below ground. And then, so I'm just saying it doesn't occur in the building. Also did it on a warm day when it was 82 degrees out. Now, you'll notice that this is the first one, the slope of the line changes because, again, the stack effect changes between cold when the interior is outside is warmer than the interior. It's going to be negative on the upper floors. So this is the, again, they're shooting for point one at the first floor, and they pretty much achieved that. But you can see then at, again, this all was 100% positive pressure. So I show the theoretical um, neutral plane, which is way beyond the top of the building. So there is no neutral plane because the building is 100% positively pressurized. So going back to that, we had, if we go back during cold weather when the problems were occurring, we had a significant positive pressure at upper floors. We were looking at almost 0.7 inches of water at the upper floors. So we had the FSK, which is trying to act as an air barrier. We had the airspace, which allowed airflow and allowed um, air, you know, air movement from both laterally, and it also formed ability for a condensation of form, because now there's an airspace, the insulation isn't in full contact. And then we had the gutters that, although they were intended to work to drain water, they also allowed air to flow as well. So we had the situation where air could bypass the FSK membrane, freely move in the airspace and allow condensation to form, and then move out of the wall through the holes to the weeps. We also had some issues on how they attached the FSK and the insulation. There was a lot of areas where the tape was not bonded, where there were miss, there's missing tape, where they just didn't put it in. And all in all, we had a lot of air movement. But we also, so we had air movement between the inside and the outside because it was positively pressurized. But we also had air movement floor to floor and even room to room because not all the buildings were at the same pressure. So we end up with air flowing through the air barrier into the space, flowing through the space, and then coming back out another case, another room. In this case, I'm showing floor to floor because of stack effect. The upper floors were slightly higher pressure than the floor below it. The air would also flow. There was also gutters in a lot of portions in the curtain wall system. We also had problems with the gutters leaking, but the main thing that I'm showing here is just that the air, there is the air tube that can actually allow air to flow, and there was multiple tubes that went through the, the system. How we solved this is that we basically put in interior back pans um, with a fire stop that no longer extended to the FSK, so now we did not have it just stopped at each floor line. I mean, we stop it at each floor line. And then we put spray foam top and bottom, which was you know, bonded to the back pans and bonded the precast, eliminating that airflow, that airspace onto which condensation could form. These are just some pictures of that.
running a little low on time, was a horse barn and arena. Now, this horse barn and arena I, was an old, was, it had been around for a while, but the new owners decided to upgrade it. And what they did is they, they put in a ceiling, an insulation. They wanted to keep the, the horse barn warmer. It's been very cold before. So they put this aluminum panel ceiling that they hung from trusses, and that was in both the arena and the horse barn area. Now, there's a lot of moisture generated in this horse barn. They actually wet down the, the sand surface so that it doesn't create dust when the horses are going around. They wash down the horses on a regular basis. There's a lot of moisture in the hay products that they use. There's just a lot of moisture. And they have no means to dissipate this moisture. But the bigger problem had to do with water dripping from the ceiling. And it was dripping from the attic through the ceiling. There was actually spots that you could see water droplets going through. When you got into the attic, there was water condensing on the underside of the plastic. Now, this was not actually the insulation. This was the original insulation in the horse barn. Remember, originally, they didn't have the ceiling. So originally there was the membrane that was attached. There was bat insulation that was underneath the metal panel. It was a metal panel roof on it. And the trusses themselves were wood and the purlins were wood. They went between the trusses. And so they, they had a continuous vapor barrier and insulation. But now this is no longer the insulation that they're primary using. We also had a lot of moisture and biological growth on the wood itself. The wood was dripping wet. It, this water would actually then drip onto the new insulation, which was a fiberglass blown in insulation over directly over the metal panels. So we have a situation where we have a new ceiling that's aluminum panels that above it had the fiberglass insulation. But this was the way it used to be. Again, you can see the insulation on the underside, it nice and dry, very drafty, not able to keep much heat in there. So it was always cold, but and you could see the underside of the ceiling. When they put the insulation in the in the metal panels, they changed all that. Now one point I want to do make here, and it's it's kind of an uh, issue that I like to make sure we get clear on projects. The aluminum panels are a very good vapor retarder or vapor barrier, but they are not a good air barrier. Aluminum is an excellent vapor barrier, and, we, and if you think about it, by, I'm talking vapor barrier as vapor diffusion, a means for stopping vapor diffusion, which is about Brownian motion, so it's based on the square footage. Airflow, on the other hand, is different because air will flow through small gaps. If you have a small gap in a vapor retarder, there isn't going to be a lot of moisture moving through from vapor diffusion. I did the demonstration where I, I took my driveway and I sprayed water on it and I put little squares of plexiglass, not plexiglass, of polyethylene on my driveway and let the driveway dry for a while, and I pulled up all the all the polyethylene squares, and it was still wet under the polyethylene squares because it was only gradually creeping in from the edges. That's because a vapor by vapor diffusion by Brownian motion, it's based on the area. However, with air gaps and a pressure difference, you can move a lot of moisture and a lot of air, which is what was happening here. The, the design 
included ventilation for the attic. And how they decided to ventilate the attic was to exhaust air from the attic. So what happened is they were making the attic negatively pressurized. They had air intakes uh, the part on the horizontal portion on the left is the horse barn. The riding arena is on the right. And they on the horse barn they had rooftop air infiltrate I mean air makeup air, but they weren't powered. The exhaust was only powered. So so effectively you had these air intakes on the barn and then you had the exhaust fans that were moving air out of the attic. Uh, in the arena they had one side was these air intakes and the other side looked very similar to the one on the lower left with the fans. We were measuring, you know, this is in Pascals, so it's not a huge pressure difference, but I found that even as little as 0.1 or 0.2 is enough if it's day and night, steady state, to cause a significant airflow and air moisture. In this case, the arena was running at negative 1.2 and negative 1.3. Those are the tubes going into the arena. And the, the tubes going into the horse barn, there was much higher negative. There was a greater diff pressure differential, a greater negative. So how, they, how we solve the problem? It was pretty straightforward, um, at least the problem for the attic. We simply reversed the fans. Instead of drawing air out, we actually blew air in. Now, one of the things that I found was interesting, we, at first we we're gonna cut them back. We, we started out with just doing it full reversal and we ended up with a 0.2 Pascal, almost neutral, which is what I was shooting for, just slightly positive. And we were blowing air in. On the day I went out there, the temperature condition outside was 35.6 degrees with 90% relative humidity and a dew point of 33 degrees. The air inside the attic almost, almost matched the air outside, which is the desired outcome. We wanted the air in the attic to almost match the outside air. That means we have very good ventilation. But the barn temperature was still pretty warm and it had a dew point of almost 60 degrees. That's pretty high. 83% relative humidity at that temperature, but the key again, remember we were looking at some of the other dew points, we said 50 degree air with at 70 degrees is a 51 degree dew point. So this is, this is more than that. So this is a significant amount of moisture. We had also put together drawings for reducing, uh, it, well we worked with a mechanical engineer to design a system to reduce the air on the inside. They have not done that yet, um, but it, we solved the problem in the attic, at least. So just sort of the key points as I close here is that I, I put these in this order. They're not necessarily the most important order, but the this five sort of takeaway key points that I want to express are that most cladding condensation problems, I'm not talking about water leaks or construction moisture, but condensation problems are caused by airflow and not vapor diffusion. The condensation from airflow almost always occurs when air moves from warm to cool areas. And since the air flows from high pressure to low pressure, it's important that you measure the pressure differential. Now the ones that I, the only one that I really feel is sensitive enough are the DG700s that we have. We have four of them in the architecture group and there's several more throughout the company. Um, those, the Energy Conservatory um, DG700s, those work very well. Because we really need a pretty low, a lot of cases of even a very low pressure difference can be enough to cause a problem. The pressure differentials can be caused by a variety of things, mechanical systems, but not just measuring the outside makeup air and the exhaust. 
you also have to know the localized effects, including duct leakage, which is a localized effect, stack effect, and wind. Finally, when looking at condensation problems, I strongly recommend that you look at the moisture in the air in terms of dew point temperature, not relative humidity, because then you can simply see by the dew point temperature of the air what, how cold the surface needs to be to have condensation. And you know that the dew point temperature won't change unless we either add moisture or take it away. And that's all I have. Thank you for your time. All right, thanks, Norbert. Um, let's go ahead and see if we have any questions here. Okay. Um, the first question here says, how easy is it to identify the types of problems you showed in your case studies ahead of time, such as during a peer review? Is it realistic to expect that these types of problems can be avoided completely based on reviewing architectural drawings and shop drawings? That's, a, that's actually a really good point because we do that as a part of our design review. A lot of times we can, but we have to be able to know what the mechanical system is doing as well. So, for instance, one of the common ways, and if we can get people to do it this way, it makes it a lot easier is to use the system that's becoming more popular where we put the vapor barrier, air barrier, and water-resistive barrier as one membrane, and then put the insulation outboard of that. And, in that, and then make sure that that is tied in with the window system. That can eliminate a lot of problems. We also can look at systems, and we know that there's going to be problems. Certain membranes, if we're relying on them to be air barriers, are probably not good choices. Taped FSK and precast, especially if they have to go behind beams and columns, is very difficult to make into a regular air barrier. So for that reason, it's we can point out things based on our experience that are more likely to to be problems than others. But you're right, it's nothing's ever perfect, but we do need to make sure that in certain situations where we do have an airspace, Again, we want to avoid air spaces uh, where condensation could be a problem. But if we have to have them, we have to alert people as the importance of getting the pressure differentials correct. Okay. The next question here says, in the brick rain screen wall, could ventilation of the rain screen have been increased to resolve the problem? And if so, how much ventilation would be enough? Um, the first part is easier than the second part. Yes, it would help. Ventilated brick walls, in fact, we, we did that in one that I worked with, Tom Wagoner, um, where it can reduce the amount of moisture by simply allowing the masonry to dry faster following a rain event due to natural convection. The other part of the problem is a little more difficult. There was a paper that looked into a variety of venting, and that paper pretty much concluded that only open head joints gave enough ventilation to get a real good convection flow, that the weep hole ventilator, the cell vents and the weep hole ventilators at two feet on center, top and bottom, did not provide enough. There have also been cases where they've used whole brick vents at the top and the bottom. So that's one of the difficulties, is that balance between how much air we need to move and aesthetics and other issues. All right, thanks. The next question here says, should we as a company be reviewing mechanical information during peer reviews and or duct system installations in the field? I, I would, I typically, that's a difficult question because it really depends on our scope. If we're not looking at the mechanical, that's not part of our scope, we at least have to alert them as to what problems may exist. If there are duct work that is in the exterior wall, we want to make sure that things like the duct work is isolated from the wall so we can't get air, them working as, uh, as their own um, duct, as a, the walls and soffits working as duct work. One of the things I've done, even in that first example where we had it from the continuously operating bathroom exhaust with the wall, 
I, a lot of times, like them to get the exterior wall to be continuous and the demising walls to butt up against it. Now, there's sometimes issues with fire. We have to be, be cognizant of that. But there's a bunch of simple things we can do to stop those kind of problems from happening. And if nothing else, we should at least alert them that if there is a critical situation that requires proper balancing, that we alert them that this, if this is negatively pressurized, we'll have a problem or vice versa. All right. Another one here. It says, how effective have you been able to develop a, to develop a horizontal air barrier in a high rise? Oh, boy. Not very effective. Um, and that, that's why I put that in there. We talk about it all the time. We talk about trying to get um, airlocks at the elevators and the stairwells. But in the case of that one building, we even had a problem with the exterior walls. There was, they had column covers that they, they worked as, um, they had the continuous insulation on the interior, but the columns jut out. So we had a bunch of, of air pass just from the precast. It's very difficult. And, and, and that's one of the things that we fight all the time. And that's where I really like to start looking at maybe ways to design wall systems that we don't rely on trying to cut the pressure, but to actually deal with the problems by eliminating the air pass, elimin or maybe not eliminate the airflow pass, but having insulation in full contact to eliminate the lateral transfer. Because remember, even if we do get stack effect, and we get that solved, we still could have the problem of short circuiting room to room. So we still have to be cognizant of, of all the different airflow paths we can have and be realistic. We may, we're probably not going to get a perfect air barrier on the floor. It doesn't mean we shouldn't try, but it should, we should also recognize that we're still probably going to get some stack effect to occur. All right. Okay, looks like we have one more here. Okay. Um, it says, what is your first step for a project where air leakage problems are suspected? Do you typically include water spray testing to confirm that water leakage is not to blame, or is it more helpful to look at air pressures first? Um, the, the most important thing with, with that is understanding. I mean, there's, there's, there's two that to sort of look at. One is the cold weather condensation problem. A lot of times you can do, you can rule out water leakage simply by when the problems occur. Like I said, typically those occur with warming periods following a long periods of cold weather. If that's the only time they see leakage, I would start maybe it may still be good, especially in a litigation, to rule out the water leakage. But you're pretty sure it's not water leakage in those cases. You can do a little bit of of investigation into that. Now, in the case, in that case, I would do pressure differences. I almost always, I almost always start with pressure differences. Even even if I'm going to do an investigation with water leakage, I'm going to do both. I'm going to bring the manometer out there and and check the pressure differences almost from the start. If I suspect that condensation from airflow is a problem. Now, warm weather problems are a little more difficult because the warm weather condensation is going to occur at the same time as the rainwater leakage. So warm weather from water leakage is going to occur at the same time as airflow issues. So in that case, I'd almost say you have to do both. But you want to check the airflow, but you're also looking for certain key things. If it's a high rise, are the problems worse at the upper levels? That might be a strong indication for airflow issues. If they're widespread, that also might be a strong indication of, of airflow. If they're the same on all elevations, that may or may not be, because sometimes, this, usually in condensation from reservoir cladding, the south and west elevations are the worst. You have to look at patterns of where the problems are occurring. So I guess that's a very long answer to the question, but a combination of things. Okay. Um, so it's two thirty. We do have one more question here that we'll I'll, uh, I'll we'll squeeze in. It says, "What's the shortest building where you have seen stack effect issues?" We saw it in a four-story building. Um, it was at that years back. 
at the infamous Omni Hotel at Charleston Place, we actually, in four stories, had enough of a pressure difference. It was tiny pressure, but we were measuring some very tiny pressures. And we had enough that would cause the difference, a visible difference between the fourth floor and the first floor. That would be the shortest I've ever seen. Typically, it's a little taller than that, but that was a warm weather condensation problem with the vinyl wall covering that really amplifies the problems. And because of that, I think that was one of the things that allowed us to see it with even a tiny pressure difference. All right. Well, um, thank you to all of you for um, all those questions. Um, Norbert, did you have anything else that you wanted to say before we wrap things up today? No, I think, I think that, again, just those key points. Um, we need to make sure that we think about pressure differences and we understand the basic physics of condensation before we go into uh, looking at a condensation problem. All right. Well, thanks again, Norbert, and thanks for joining us. We hope you have a great afternoon.